Cool. Well, hi, and welcome to another AW interview. Well, today we're joined by European and Commonwealth champion and world medalist Harry Aikens Ariti for an insight into his training program. So you guys at home can get some tips on your own sessions. Well, Harry, um, you had this training session, kind of this open session down in uh, Southwark uh, the other week. Firstly, how was that? And secondly, you know, what was the kind of the reaction to that session? Oh, no, it was really good. Um, obviously, um, it was in partnership with with you and um, it was really nice to get some people down who had different backgrounds, whether it be within running itself or just took part and were, you know, fitness fanatics in some perspective. Um, it went down well. A lot of people obviously um, gave me feedback saying how awkward things felt, but how enjoyable it was to do something different. Um, I think what they took away from it was just understanding how to move their body and how to train in a different type of way. And like, you know, th these kind of sessions, is this something that you've done recently, just getting loads of people down to a track to do that kind of thing? Yeah, um, I've openly invited a few people and where it's been such a positive, um, you know, sort of moment for them, they've encouraged me to you know, push it out to more people and, and invite and just create a bit more of a community around track. I think athletics in itself is lacking a little bit of something like this in terms of a community aspect. Um, you know, when you look at the CrossFit community or you look at the runners community, um, typical sprint work doesn't really have that. Um, so it's quite nice to be able to be involved in something where people are, uh, individuals are coming across and enjoying it to the degree they are. And are there any you know certain are there any certain areas within those sessions that you think this is going to be really impactful or is it or is it kind of the sense that it's every part of that session or every part of certain sessions that you've grown up with that you think and actually this is going to be pretty valuable to people kind of having some idea of when you do these open days um it's one of those ones where when you see individuals have an idea as to how to get along with it they're mainly thinking that they can take something from it mentally. And then all of a sudden it, it changes because they have a bit more respect for you and what you do. Uh, they have an understanding as to how to move. That's one, something that I find is really impactful in the sense that, you know, certain drills that I'll do with them is obviously I could, you know, be specific as to talking about, you know, dorsiflexion and ground contacts and whatever else, but that's not going to be very helpful. So, you know, something I'll do is start talking to them. I'll ask them to skip for height, skip as high as you can. Um, and then from that, because obviously, you know, we work, you know, we try to move forward, we're sprinting forward. I'm teaching them to take all of that energy in terms of trying to get a maximum height with each skip and counting, carrying momentum to then try and take that moving forward. So then I'll ask them to skip for distance. So now you're going to skip, but take that same energy and movement and power and force, but the trajectory is forward now. So then they've got to figure that out. So it's a mental game. It's also figuring out how your body can apply force going one way and you've got to carry that momentum going forward. Um, then you take that, you make them do some bounds. Obviously now they've learned how to move forward. Now it's about moving, uh, you know, as powerfully forward as possible. You give them, you tell them to bound for five steps. You put down the cone. Now get past that on your second attempt. So you get past it in your third attempt, figure out how you're moving. That's basically what, the best thing to do is uh, when you're dealing with individuals that don't know the technicality of sprinting is understanding how to move and understanding how to use the tools that you already have. And I guess that is the thing, isn't it? It is not just putting out a session, but it is simplifying that session. It is making it relatable to people that in ways that they will understand in their everyday lives. And then looking at the progression from that, not just as you mentioned about you know, you know, saying words to them, which are so technical that they're going to go, hold on a minute. Would yeah. you mean by that? Um, yeah. So like for you then kind of growing up, when did you start to first get into kind of training sessions um, in athletics and track and field? Um, I found my way to Sutton Arena when I was about 13 or 12 or so. Um, it, uh, I, I was lucky enough to join a group a hurdles group. I was a failed hurdler. So um, they asked me to hurdle. I couldn't hurdle. He said, just sprint. Uh, Leslie Alder was my first coach and um, he had a really, really good group. Had a few like AAA champions and English schools champions over the hurdles. Um, so, you know, it was just twice a week, your standard club sessions, uh, Tuesday, Thursday, 6.30 to late. 
that was me pretty much every week and up until you know things started to go really well for me when I was about 16 17 I think we added on an extra day um and then that was me training up until I was about 19 four days a week when I was at uni um when I was about eight, eight, 17 18 and then I went into a full-time program when I went to Loughborough and trained with Michael Camel. So what was the split generally between cardio and kind of gym work then? Um, track work, it depends. I've had different programs which have sort of been at different intensities. Um, I've had one program where, you know, we're on the track four days a week. So it would be a Monday, Tuesday, Thursday and a Saturday. Um, and we were doing some form of conditioning or gym work on a, um, I think, daily uh, yeah Monday Tuesday Wednesday Thursday Friday um, that was with Kamel so it wasn't necessarily gym gym it was just like conditioning as well as anything else um, so it could be anything from you know just just circuits um, to then your general you know lifting sessions um, at the moment I probably train a little less in terms of that perspective uh, I probably train uh, I'm on the track three or four days a week so Monday um, could be a double day. So it could be Monday. Uh, I'm on the track and on the gym. Um, and then Tuesday track, Wednesday gym. Thursday will be like a recovery day. Friday uh, be track and then possibly Saturday track um, with the idea that one of those days will have gym as well. So a um, little less in the gym and, uh, you know, just a little bit more fluency to my movement in regards to how I'm moving on the track. Nice. So that's a, you literally answered my next point because I was about to say, what does a typical training week or you know look like for you? So it is quite varied then through the week. Um, yeah, I think with family life as well, you've got to manage things as best as you can. Um, I, I I I focus my time in around camps. Um, that that's when I find that things uh, go really well from that perspective. But um, yeah, Mondays tend to be your acceleration day uh, with a bit of gym after. Um, Tuesday, we like to do double days in terms of like one day after the other um, because, you know, you carry some fatigue into the next day. Um, that tends to be my endurance sessions, like speed endurance of some form, depending on what time of year it is, depends on the type of session it is. Um, Wednesday will be a, um, a sort of like gym day. Um, so again, I'll be uh, um, doing the majority of whatever ballistic movements I need to do, dynamic movements I need to do. Thursday will probably be a recovery day. And then Friday, I would look to do some sprinting um, on the track. Um, and then Saturday, maybe a gym day, or depending on what time of year it is, I might do an endurance session again on the Saturday. Nice. Uh, are they kind of structured every, you mentioned kind of the seasons as well. Do they kind of swap over a certain days when you, between summer and winter then? Um, not necessarily. Obviously, as you get closer to competition, you, you compete on weekends. So that means one session's out if that's what happens, or um your 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 mix your week around competition weeks. But in terms of general training, that tends to stay the same. It's just more so the sessions and the uh, the goals, the intensity, the the volume of the sessions differ. So obviously during the months of um well, October through to December is more volume you're talking about you know rebuilding your engine as you might say um quantity over quality to some degree um whereas once you go into your you know January competition December you add a little bit of speed for competing competing in um for February if you do indoors but you'll then go into a stage where you're you know minimizing the volume and concentrating more on the quality a little yeah. bit of speed work in terms of speed endurance um and trimming down from that perspective in terms of the the, the quality but increasing the speed so what are your favorite and least favorite sessions then uh, I love you're, right, blocks, you're right uh, in the spot now yeah blocks i'm all over over you know 20 30 meters i think competitive work for me is really really important because it gets me up to a point where i need to be something that i've struggled with the last few seasons obviously when you have a training group or being in COVID, you, I've been training by myself. 
Um, so that's something, you know, is always a nice way to prepare yourself. It's kind of similar to sparring in boxing, I guess, where, you know, you get uh, an opportunity to um, work on things under pressure. Uh, because sometimes when you're doing these movements you think you're you know in the best shape of your life or you're doing things perfectly well then you go to a race and it's just like whoa what just happened um you know at the same time I like doing probably everyone knows my favorite session would probably be like three three 120s with about 10 to 12 minutes in between that's like my tester session as you would say before like most competitions or it lets me know at the end of a camp where I'm at um when I hit certain times in that session um least favorite sessions they always tend to be during the winter um so 300s 250s I'm asthmatic and obviously I'm fairly dense with muscle so um I get a lot of lactic and my lungs struggle so that sort of work is always always a struggle nice what, what about what would you say kind of like in, impactful you mentioned kind of the 120s there would you say they are the ones which as you mentioned give you the best barometer kind of where you are um as a tester session yeah but in terms of uh what sessions actually really do me a lot of justice would probably be 150s um if i can get some 150s for a certain period of time in the bank um good quality runs um there's a little bit of over distance obviously but is that a right sort of pace point which allows me to hit at certain speeds and, and maintain a certain rhythm um that sort of session and, and sleds um I need to do a lot of sleds for myself because just my trajectory where I've had a bad back and things like that in the past um I can often just stand up when it allows me to focus on technical aspects as well as a bit of resistance training and timing so um I'm working on efforts if that makes sense I'm maximum efforts yeah and that can help um so yeah that's 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 those two sort of sessions there kind of go hand in hand it's interesting because I mean, just going on the, the women's hundred meters from Tokyo, that or just really on Elaine Thompson and Shelly Ann Fraser Price, that Shelly Ann always has a very, very good start off the blocks. And then Elaine Thompson always gets that top line speed towards the last kind of 70, 80 meters. Is it the kind of thing where you would look at, you know, certain styles of your running, for example, and then you go back to training and say, actually, I need to pinpoint this, this, and this? Um, because there, I also mentioned that there was a video online, I think, that uh, I saw a few weeks ago where there was actually a camera within the blocks and it was Elaine going out of the blocks and you can see her footwork on her toes instantly with the spikes. Do you look at that kind of footage as well and think to yourself, how can I improve starts yeah. races? Yeah, yeah, no. The, 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 the thing about track and field is obviously, um, I'm sure Elaine would love to have a, a better start or match Shelley's start and definitely continue that. Uh, that speed that she gets up to obviously you're talking about energy distribution through a race um, but you know some people are better starters than others um, and some people have uh, a better top speed or better speed maintenance than others because we all slow down once we all hit our top speed it's about how you know how slow you slow down as opposed to um, anything else um, feedback and you know there's there's so many forms of you know, you can use the opt to jump. Um, I use timing gates. Uh, you can use a speed gun. Um, you know, there's so many ways that you can curate data that to, to reflect what it is that you're trying to do. But you've got to have a clear vision of what you're trying to achieve and what you're trying to improve on. Otherwise, you can get a little bit lost. Um, for me, uh, all of last season, we were just working on not necessarily having the quickest 60. Uh, we were just working on, you know, having that build through so that I could sort of hit my top end speed and that's where I am sort of better further down the track um of course I would love to be able to be one of those guys that can get to 10 20 30 first um and there are scenarios where that may be the case but it's not necessarily just being the best um you know you're trying to be the best version of yourself but no doubt everyone would love to be the best at every point in the race and I guess that kind of goes into my final point about training really is that you know, like mindset is obviously massively important going into it. And there'll be people kind of watching or, you know, reading kind of the piece where they're thinking, well, I can do like two or three sessions earlier in the week, but then that motivation to keep going is the big thing that kind of, you know, that's the, the hurdle, the challenge, if you like, to get to that point of consistency kind of long-term yeah. season. Um, how does that work then with like atmospheres and training groups? Because obviously a lot of your medals at major champs have come in the relays. So mm. 
how does that mindset translate to working in kind of a group with uh, with GB guys as well? Um, I, they're just a common understanding. I think uh, after 2015, um, we had a few interventions with um, some really positive um, interventions, I might add, with uh, the inclusion of Jen Savage. Um, she helped us understand each other in a different type of perspective and she gave us, um, you know, and this was a really big thing from, you know, from Neil, Neil Black's perspective um, and Christian's perspective. Um, and it helped us just understand that there's a common identity between us and it's all that we all want to succeed and, you know, we've all got common respect for one another. So although we want to be the best, um, you know, we also want to be the best relay team as well. So, you know, we can transition into that quite nicely. Um, but equally, if you're around fast individuals or you train with fast individuals, it's only going to help you because, you know, you're setting the trend. You can only try and keep up with them. You're helping them push themselves and they're pushing you. So, um, you know, it's always good to be around like minded individuals and people of a similar pace. And I guess with relays as well, like when you practice the relays, there is that almost synthetic nature, if you like, of you can have know the guys pretty well that you can kind of read signals as well if something is wrong. Yeah. So um, obviously now, um, you know, I wasn't able to compete this year, but, you know, I was still in, I was still down at the last camp before they went off uh, to uh, Tokyo. Um I mean, I'm really looking forward to being part of the setup next year again. Um, you tend to know individuals where their hand's going to be. You tend to know certain people, how they accelerate. Um, and then there's a common amount of trust because obviously you've done it with each other and you learn how to respect that and you learn how to trust one another. So it's going to be it's going to be good, especially with how things are progressing in terms of um, competitions. Now we've got three comps uh, in one season, which will be quite nice to get through, especially from a relay perspective um individually as well it's going to be quite taxing but that's why the relays are always there to come together at the end of it and um and to get something out of it as well 100 100 percent. um just quickly on well 2021 really um what have you made of 100 meters generally both men's and women's it's um i think the women's have you know just stayed president as to say how lucky we are to be in a generation where you have so many women running 10, 10, six, 10, fives, um, you know, 10, 10, sevens, uh, sub 11 performances have been the most I've sort of taken note of. And it's nice to see the Europeans being as competitive as well. Um, and it's nice to have, um, I think what we're seeing in the men's uh, sprints is just a bit of a rejig, um, obviously a, a change of guard as you might have, you know, you've got your hybrid sprinters like Fred Curley coming along. Um, you've got um, individuals on our perspective, in our team, having, you know, coming coming up with some challenges, maybe for the first, second time in their career. And it's always, there's never a right time for these type of challenges, but, you know, they're, they're pushing through and, you know, it's, it's adding character to a lot of individuals. Obviously, Dina having her trials and tribulations through the season, um, but still, you know, finishing off the season very proudly. Um, as well as, you know, in the men's sprints, you've got individuals like Trayvon Bromel, who's had such a, you know, resurgence, which has been amazing to see because he's been through a lot. Um, and unfortunately, it didn't come together for him at the Olympics, but he still finishes off the season with another personal best running 976. So, yeah. you, know, you know, there's so much that's happened and everyone's entitled to a moment. Um, I'm just looking forward to getting back involved. What do you think? Do you think you know people like Trayvon and Fred can get to like 10 sixes next year I guess it's I mean, with, the track in the wind but with the development of spikes and the development of tracks and you know good conditions and everyone pushing each other I, I, I don't see why not um, I'm never going to say that they can't because you know I'm, I'm someone who's still you know pushing my boundaries and thinking and believing that I can run certain times so you know God knows what what their targets are um is to be the fastest man in the world, no doubt. And I'm sure that they want to break records. And, you know, with with the way things are going in track, I think the uh, the guy from Kenya, um, 977, I'm pretty sure his personal best before Olympics was 10 yeah, So <laughs> to take three temps off, um, you know, what's to say that someone else can't take two temps off or, 
or whatever else. You know, Fred Curdy is consistently running nine eights. Once you're consistently running a certain time, that's when you do suspect a drop to come. Um, Trayvon has run nine seven seven, I think four times now. Um, what's to say that he's not gonna, you know, drop drop a nine six nine? Johan Blake did, so you know, yeah. There's, there's no reason to say why not. So lastly, for me, Harry, what are your goals then for for next year? What do you want to get out of 2022? I want to run sub 10. Um, I want to be as competitive as possible, um, be present at every championships and, you know, be in that sort of boundaries, running 10-0s and potentially running 9-9s if I can, you know, run close to my PB, which I've done. I think I'll be in a, in a good spot to make the team and then to be as competitive as possible in that, be a part of the relay team and get some medals.